I'm Elizabeth Alfano at Sundance. One of my very favorite films at the festival is The Game Changers. I'll be sitting down with Ultimate Fighter James Lightning Wilkes, who, along with some other characters like incredible athlete and weightlifter Patrick Bogumian and anti-poacher Damian Mander, to talk about the film and how they lay out in exquisite detail and break open the myth that meat is the protein you need. James, thanks for speaking with me today. Oh yeah, thanks for having me. So I saw The Game Changers, and it's just one of my very favorite films at the festival. Tell me about your entire journey from researching about going vegan and being sort of shocked about it, and then being angry about what you thought you knew. Right, well I didn't go into it sort of you know, with any preconceived notions or even looking into the vegan diet. I literally got injured, uh, tore both of my knees, had six months where I thought, what can I do with my time? started researching diet for optimal recovery and performance and that's when I came across a study about the Roman gladiators uh, 68 skeletons that were analyzed the only known burial site in the world and they did a strontium calcium analysis and radioisotope analysis and they could tell that they were in eating almost exclusively plants and um, that sort of blew my mind thought that can't be true and so you know spent all of this time about a thousand hours in the first year reading peer-reviewed science on nutrition and that's when I sort of unearthed, we've been really been led to believe this myth that we have to have meat in order to be healthy, in order to be strong, athletic, and other animal products as well. And um, it's just simply not true. And uh, that sort of set me on this journey, basically. And then the more I uncovered about how we've been marketed to and lied to by the industry, that's when I realized, uh, you know, I just started getting quite angry about it because and not only is it affecting people's performance, but more importantly, it's affecting people's health. And the leading chronic diseases, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, largely are impacted by what we eat. So it's, it's, it's pretty uh, aggravating. Along with director Luis Ahoyas, you make some excellent points about how a plant-based diet can actually reverse some of these trends, like colon cancer, diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Actually, it's, it's been shown in, you know, for heart disease, for example, a plant-based diet and uh, controlled studies is the only clinical intervention that's been able to show reversal of heart disease. Um, and pretty quickly. Yeah, very quickly. There's been changes within, within a week or two. Under angiogram, you can see arteries actually opening up. And uh, that's never been shown with any drug or any other intervention. And then uh, you know, Dean Ornish went on to show the same with prostate cancer reversals, dropped in PSA levels. And they're now doing a study with Alzheimer's, and they believe um, they've got every reason to believe that that's going to uh, reduce and, and prevent that as well. So pretty incredible. I'm so interested to see those results when they come out. So talk to me a little bit about the second myth. I mean, the first myth of meat, I think, is that you need animal protein, or specifically, you need meat to be strong. And then right behind that is you need milk for your bones. So both of those are completely false. But there's also this myth that if you eat a lot of meat, you're a really manly man. Tell me about that and yeah, if that's false. I think the real men eat meat myth is sort of a really core underlying myth underneath all of this. And, uh, you know, eight out of 10 vegetarians or vegans are female. Um, young men, especially 18 to 45 men, eat twice as much meat as women. Um, and they're just less likely to switch because it's really based on identity and this myth that we've been sold. Um, and not only is it not necessary, but the very foods that men think are making them more masculine are the exact foods that are weakening and killing more men than anything else. And so, uh, it's, it's not just a myth that where you know, this industry is profiting, but that it's actually killing and weakening um, you know, more people than anything else. And it really is the world's most dangerous myth. It's, it's killing more people than anything else, and it's also affecting our planet in, in a very negative way. So we're going to get to animals and the planet in a second for sure, but I think it's also interesting to note you're saying that there's a myth about a manly man eats a lot of meat, but very directly in the film you say that it actually decreases sexual desire, performance, etc., which I think is very interesting. Yeah, we actually did an experiment with uh, Dr. Aaron Spitz, who's the lead delegate for urology for the American Medical Association. And uh, we'd already done an experiment with the Miami Dolphin showing how you could reduce blood for two to eight, uh, blood flow for two to eight hours if you ate an animal-based meal. And, um, and so when I met Dr. Spitz, I said, would this affect sexual performance? He said, absolutely. Not only do men have increased prostate cancer risk the more animal foods they eat, um, but also the, the blood flow to their penis, one of the smallest, some of the smallest arteries in the body. And so we did an experiment with some college athletes, um, or Dr. Spitz did, and we, we documented that. 
and there were significant changes to um, circumference and rigidity of erections and the duration of erections as well, simply based on a single meal. And that can last for two to eight hours. And of course, what do you do um, after two, eight, or, you know, six hours or so, you eat again. So you're in this constant state of um, what's called endothelial dysfunction, which is also leads to erectile dysfunction. So I would argue here, men are always saying, oh, well, my wife doesn't want to sleep with me and my wife doesn't want to have sex. But I would turn that around and I would wonder if it's really the men who are slowing up in this department. So uh, you want to help your sex life, go eat some plants. Uh, let me talk to you about one final thing before I bring in some of your colleagues who are also in the film. So you're taking the meat industry pretty head on here and, you're, and the milk dairy industry and you're saying flat out that this is a marketing scheme. Do you expect some backlash or have you had some already? Oh, I think there's going to be some backlash for sure. Oh, yeah, we're in it. We're ready. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I mean, anything that's going to negatively impact their, their profits, you know. And as we show in the film, they, they, they hire these sort of scientists for hire to generate false and misleading statements to lead to confusion so that people aren't consumed. You know, butter's good for you one day, it's not the next. Um, and so, basically, I think the meat industry is going to, to create their own campaigns to try and smear the information that we've put. But we know we have the science. I interviewed at department chairs at Oxford and Yale and Harvard and, and the consensus between all of these experts. They might have slightly different views on exactly what we should be eating, but they all agree that it should be a plant-based predominant diet and, and the facts and the science back us up. Because of course animals eat plants and so all you're doing is taking the animal out of the equation. The animals get all of their nutrients from plants. Calcium, etc. it all comes from greens. So. Yeah, exactly. And, and the protein, all protein originates in plants. Animals don't make uh, that protein, and so they're just the middlemen, and they're a very inefficient middlemen. So, not only are we to take a lot more calories in to get a calorie out, but the protein you can get, you know, all the uh, amino acids that you need from uh, from eating plants. And there's this sort of notion that plant protein is can incomplete, but as long as you're eating a wide variety of plant foods and, and enough food, um, and you're getting enough protein, the science is very clear that the source is actually irrelevant in terms of getting those amino acids. And there's benefits to plant-based eating, particularly around inflammation and in the blood flow, that's better oxygen, better nutrients to the muscles. And then in terms of you know, muscles and joints, less uh, inflammation, so faster recovery, back to training sooner. And uh, that next training session is actually more productive, so leading to measurable and significant advantages in athletic performance. So let's talk to your trainer. Lou is here and he can kind of sneak in. So we're going to, uh, we're on a tiny couch here today at Sundance. It's pretty busy. So uh, let's talk to Lou and I'm going to ask you a very indiscreet question. How old are you, sir? I'm 61 years old. Oh, right. So uh, tell me about your daily workout at 61. And you're a vegan. I'm vegan. Okay. Tell me about your daily workout. Uh, my daily workout is a variety of things that I normally do, but I start off with the morning about five o'clock in the morning, sometimes 4.30. And what I do is I start off doing like the cardio concept, rowing machine stairs or even the bike. And then I start doing things like um, uh, high intensity training with the kettlebells, club bells, and the rope that we call the whip. So I go through all those things uh, at least uh, twice a week. And then I start doing uh, just regular strength training uh, where I'm just doing regular weightlifting with dumbbells. But usually I work out about five days a week between 45 minutes to an hour and 15 minutes. And I just try not to take so much rest and I try to be real uh, consistent at what I do. So I try not to miss time working out. Now, since I've been here, I, I missed a couple of days. Yeah, I can't find it really tough to get to. Oh, yeah. Sunday on your trouble. <laughs> yes, yes. But that's basically what I do. I do a lot of core training, a lot of functional strength training, uh, a lot of uh, uh, Travada training. So my training is always moving, moving, moving. There's not much rest in between. So my metabolism, when I get it up, it's always burning. I'm always burning fat. I'm always produce, producing uh, growth hormone. That's what I'm trying to produce with hardly uh, taking any rest in between. And that's what uh, is the most important thing that I'm trying to do. And when you do this hour workout, you might have, I think in the movie you were talking about 800 reps at yeah. some point. I want to make sure I get that right. But tell me specifically about what you'll do in an hour. Like what kind of reps and what kind of weight? Okay, the reps that I'm doing when I do the 800 reps, we're basically doing uh, kettlebells. So when we do like kettlebell swings, so we do kettlebell swings, we probably do 50 a set on each arm. So that right there puts you right now at 100 reps. So then we might go... Uh, uh, 50 uh, 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 cleans 
and then cleans on each arm. So that now we're at 200 reps. Then we go 50 snatches. So as we start to do all these lifts, then we start doing high pulls. Then we start doing a clean and jerk. Uh, with, with the kettlebells. Then we start doing, we do those individually. Then we start doing a complex. We do them all together in one set. So we, we make a combination of all of those together. So now you're talking about if we're doing, uh, say, 25 of each. So in five times 25 on each arm, or mm -hmm. five times 25 with both arms, then we may do two sets of the complex training with the kettlebells. So that's how we easily get up to 800. It's very easy to do, but you just have to have the stamina. But most of all, you got to be focused right here and not think about what comes next. Because we can do it with five or six guys, and you still actually haven't recovered. It's that intense when you do it. Mm -hmm. So you need to really focus and not think about, oh, that's a lot of reps. That's not important. What's important is, uh, can you really uh, control your recovery. Get control of your recovery, your breathing, yeah. and your relaxation. That way you can really uh, get into the workout again when it comes to you because it comes very quickly if you got three or four guys. And that's where the nutrition really comes yes. in as well is if you're eating the right foods, you're going to have better blood flow, you're getting better oxygen, yeah. better nutrients to the muscles, and that allows you to recover quicker, not just between sets, but also after the next day, less sore, less delayed onset muscle soreness if you're, e if you're eating the right foods. So tell me what you both had for breakfast today. Uh, I had oatmeal uh, with, uh, what did I have? It was some hemp seeds in it, and I had uh, mixed berries, and I had some unsweetened soy milk. That's what I had. I had tempeh with avocado, and I had lentil soup. Oh, now that is a breakfast of champions, yes. people. Oh, that is seriously good. Well, okay, let's talk a little bit about the environment as well. Mm -hmm. So you hit on this and also animal welfare slightly, uh, but it's well known, I think, at this point that the emissions that come from factory farming, mm -hmm. not only do they take up an enormous amount of land but, and water, but they put out more emissions than all the cars, trains, automobiles, planes put together. So um, what kind of change would this have on the environment if people took meat out of their daily eating, let's say three times a week? Yeah, I mean, this has a massive impact. It's the number one thing that you could do personally. I mean, people talk about limiting their shower use or, um, you know, cutting down the amount of time they're in the shower or changing their life. So negligible. Or, or, yeah, and it's, it's, it's so minuscule compared to literally changing uh, your shower. I mean, a single hamburger weighing between 50 and, and 70 grams has, uh, on average, 2,400 liters of embedded water. And so people can't really... <clears throat> it's easy to understand the shower because you turn that on and off and you're experiencing it. But when you're talking about the meat, you don't see that the amount of water that went in to grow the grain, to feed the, the, the cattle. The cattle also are drinking water. Um, so a huge amount of resources going in to provide just a small amount of uh, the food. So tell me that statistic again. How many liters for one hamburger? It's 2,400 liters for an average 50 to 70 grand hamburger of embedded water. You know, the, all the water that went into that I before, uh, yeah. 2,400 liters. Yeah. Holy cow. Wow, that's incredible. Um, so I have assumed this has a great environmental impact, but also it has an impact for animals. So we were going to talk to someone who's uh, <laughs> right coming in. You see, it's just a mess at, at Sundance. It's madness all the way around. He's going to come join us. So, uh, Damien Mander, thanks for, thanks for hopping in, literally, um, at this very loud, noisy place here at Sundance. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about the animal aspect here. So I'm, I've been vegan now for two years, well, one year really. I went pescatarian and then vegan for a solid year and I die hard and would never go back. And I originally got into it for the animals. Um, tell me how you got into being vegan and why it's important to you. So I mean, my background, I was special operations, spent a bunch of years in, uh, in Iraq and then finished up, you know, for a lot of guys that finish up in that sort of environment, the, the battle doesn't start until the bullets stop and you're trying to reintegrate back into society. And, you know, I was, you know, went downhill pretty quick, spent a year in South America doing too much drugs and alcohol, trying to figure out, you know, there's no job for a sniper in the, in the local newspaper when you get back home. Uh, really? No, there's not actually. Uh, got my shit together and got a one-way ticket to Africa. Uh, went there for a bit of an adventure. This is where you're from originally, right? Don't no, I Aussie. hear? Come on. Oh, sorry. I thought I heard South African in there. Okay, Aussie. Right. All right. Aussie. Okay, big drinker. Yes, there you go. <laughs> Teasing. Um, you know, so just, uh, you know, I went over there. For, I, didn't, I didn't join the military to serve my country. I did it for adventure. I didn't go to uh, Iraq to help the situation. I went there for money. I didn't come to Africa looking for a, a cause. I went looking for a fight, you know. But a couple of things happened to me when I was over there. I was looking at um, 
you know, the hard work that these rangers were doing out there on the front lines and, and seeing the animals that were being protected, you know. So I you know, decided to put some shitty skills to, to what I think is a better use, and that was protecting animals. And, uh, but, you know, I walked around in the bush for four years protecting one group of animals and coming home and eating, eating another group of animals. And, you know, conservation can't be a nine-to-five job. You know, you're either in or you're out. Uh, you know, if you, I mean, conservationists get involved with conservation because, one, they either love animals or, two, they love the environment or a combination of the two. So, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't do that nine to five and, and uh, you know, come home and then forget about, you know, my obligations as a person that, that you know, I, I'm an animal lover, you know, but not, not, I don't select different species that I choose to love. It's across the board because uh, the only difference in the capacity for each animal to suffer is the difference we have in our own minds. That's right, and I would agree with that. I'm an animal lover as well, and as much as I love rhinos and elephants, which is primarily what you protect, and I do, and I've been to Africa, and, and I just got back from Asia doing some work on uh, Asian elephant conservation, but, but um, nothing compares to the numbers that are affected by factory farming around the world. True. Uh, you know, I mean... You know, I, 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 we have to be out there on the front lines, you know, with weapons out there to protect animals. Uh, so what do you do exactly? I can't, I can't give that sort of information. Oh, no, gosh, it's juicy. We, we, run, we run an organisation, the International Anti-Poaching Foundation, which I founded, now registered in five countries, working through southern and east Africa. So we're the last line of defence for animals out there, like elephant and rhino, that are being targeted by paramilitary forces uh, for their horn, in the case of the rhino, going for now like $40,000 a pound. And, uh, and, and ivory from elephants. Uh, so we're out there providing that, that last line of, of uh, protection for them. So you literally take out poachers. You literally shoot poachers on site. Is that accurate? Look, we, um, you know, we're in a conflict situation and sometimes things do uh, escalate uh, you know, into, into you know, situations that we try and avoid. You know, what, what we try and do is train rangers to a certain level so they're able to take charge of a situation before it gets out of control. But, um, you know, getting back to your question before, you know, we, I mean, we, we have to have armed people out there on the front lines, men and women. And, uh, you know, that's what we have to do to protect animals. But the actual, the easiest way to protect an animal, don't stick it in your mouth, you know. And that, that links back to that factory farming thing, you know. The, the biggest decisions we can make in our life and for this planet, for our civilization, for our generation, starts on the dinner table. That's actually right. And I think we have to ask ourselves, so this one simple change in our life, food, can affect the environment, our health, which means our health costs, which is this topic we're all talking about right now, and the animals and how animals and the planet and people all interrelate. We all live together in the same place, so we have to get along. Uh, and it doesn't make any sense to deplete all of our resources and our health for what boils down to sort of a drug addiction at this point. I don't know. Why do you think people are holding so steadfast to something that's clearly bad for them? Well, I think it's, it's multifactorial. I think there's these sort of driving mechanisms that we have for fat, sugar, and salt. Um, you know, there's a taste that we've been grown up, grown up with, and there's a lot of emotional attachments to food as well. I mean, if you can, <clears throat> if you smell bacon, and perhaps you had great conversations with your dad at the dinner table when you're eating bacon, you know, as a kid, there's lots of emotional sort of connections going on as well. But as we talk about in the film, there's a massive sort of multi-billion dollar industry marketing to us, um, especially to young men. You know, to be a real man, this is what you should be eating. But we're just led to believe uh, that it's healthy to eat it, that we were built to eat it, and it's all completely untrue. So I think there's a lot of factors at play. And it's hard to give up a habit that you've been, you know, doing for, for your whole life three times a day. But these changes, I mean, if you start incorporating more plant-based options, you'll see that there's great tasting food that makes you feel good. And rather than thinking of an exclusion, it's just incorporating these new foods. And you'll find, this is what I found, is pretty quickly it started pushing out those other foods. And, uh, you know, my wife and I, my wife does a lot of the cooking, I do some of the cooking, and uh, we're always saying, you know, perhaps we could have this once a week, but I've said that 50 or 60 times now. Mm -hmm. There's not enough days in the week to eat all of these great you know, plant-based tasting foods. So. It's so true. My boyfriend still eats meat, but he begs me for my vegan euros, so I think anyone can turn a corner if Join he can. Yes, right, exactly. Hey, Got that? that time, man up, man up. <laughs> I like it. I like your style. I like how you roll. Uh, one last question. I also like how James Cameron rolls. So how did he get involved with this film? Because he's been a longtime vegan and proponent of this kind of diet. So how did he get involved? Well, he's very passionate about the environment and also health. I mean, if you look at photos of him 10 years ago, he looks 10 years younger now than he did 10 years ago. Uh, so... He looks like he's not 20 years off of his, uh, you know, 20 years off of his, uh, his looks. And um, he's just very passionate about it. He heard about the project through Rip Esselstyn, the firefighter in the film. 
And um, then when he heard Louis was on board, he felt obviously very confident in the project. And he understood, you know, the direction we were taking, especially the, the marketing and the sort of real many meat myth, which we really feel is an underlying um, the, the underlying myth really to driving consumption. 18 to 45 year old males eat twice as much meat as women. 8 out of 10 vegetarians and vegan are female. And it's all based on identity, right? So it's, there's no stigma against a, a female eating a tofu salad and might actually get props from her friends. But it, there's, a, there's a big stigma against eating sort of a, a plant based meal while your buddies are eating steak and potatoes. And so, you know, but if you're, if you're a sort of leader and uh, you don't really care what people think, then, you know, you can go ahead and just eat those foods anyway it's becoming more accepted now anyway and with the myths and the, the role models that we've shown in this film i think it's pretty clear that you know whatever your perception of what a real man is you can uh, that can fit in with whatever your perception is and and uh, and th those very foods that people think you're making them more masculine are actually weakening and killing more men than anything else so it's very clear that um the plant-based uh, way of eating is the way to go but it's i mean like the just just to finish on that you know, us as men, uh, you know, we picture ourselves and I think we are pictured as, as uh, you know, defenders and those that should protect the vulnerable. And animals in our society are, are the most vulnerable that we have, you know. And, you know, if there's anyone in this world that should be protecting the vulnerable, it should be us guys, you know. We should be leading from the front and, and, and you know, I think that's what being a real man is. It's not about, uh, you know, doing all this macho shit. It's actually about, uh, you know, acknowledging what's, what's true and, and being honest to that. And being smart about it. Yeah, I mean... I mean, like for me, you know, I'm, I'm not into this because of uh, the sports side or the training side, obviously. Um, you know, for me, it's an ethical decision. You know, I, just, I, I don't want to, I don't want to fuck with something that, that can't defend itself. You know, why, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to do that? Yes, I completely agree. The package just showed up as well. We've got time on. Okay. Uh, how are we on time? Panzer, come on in for Patrick, one quick question. On one quick question, and Thanks then we got to go. <laughs> hey, vegan badass, I What's love up? your shirt. Uh, <laughs> Thanks you. for joining at the last minute. Yeah, yeah, I, I had some problem, problems getting through the snow, but no, I'm here. <laughs> We're all here. One quick question for you. Tell me what is the most that you have ever lifted mm -hmm. and why you think you can do that. <laughs> well, uh, the most I ever lifted over my head would be a 200-kilo uh, log, which is... Uh, okay. Yeah, something like that, Four, 450, something like that, yeah. Um, and uh, the, the most weight I ever moved was a fire engine that was 22 metric tons. <laughs> a fire <laughs> engine? Uh, yeah, you, you're pulling it like a horse, so, so it, you got it on your back and you just walk with it. How is that physically possible? Uh, well, um, we, we train for that, so, so the sport that I'm doing is, is called Strongman, and we, we, we train, uh, you, you have to have a lot of training um, before you do stuff like that, but, um, and, and of course I, I have the advantage uh, because of my diet uh, that uh, it helps me uh, being able to compete against guys who are much bigger than I am, I'm, I'm not very tall, and most of the Strongmen are much taller than I am, uh, but uh, I'm recovering very fast because of my diet and everything, so uh, that gives me the edge to be able to uh, kick some ass uh, against those guys. So if you want to see a bunch of manly men, and if you want to educate yourself about what's actually good for you and what's good for the planet, and as men taking care of the planet, then you'll want to see the Game Changers. Everybody, thanks for speaking with me. Awesome. Thank thanks you. so much for having us. Thank you.